back. We're here at Flat Six Innovations Research and Training Center. I'm with here with Jake Ravy, the gentleman that's the originator of the first commercially available product in terms of uh, the IMS and the IMS bearing. Uh, so in a, in a video prior to this one, we learned about the function of the IMS and the function of the bearing, and you went through all of that. So now that we understand what we have in our car, let's just kind of go through and talk about what our options are and what's it like to maintain and prevent possible failures. My question to you is, I have a car with this setup in it. What can I do as an owner to mitigate possibly having a bearing failure? Absolutely want to help with this. <laughs> this is, we get this question at Flat Six Innovations all the time. My classes are filled with this particular question from guys that, that just don't want to change the bearing for whatever reason. They're either purist by nature, um, they think that they don't really have a problem, they think it won't happen to them. Uh, unfortunately, it does happen to some of those folks and I've had people have a failure while they were on my wait list to have a bearing changed <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, but there are things that you can do other than just throwing parts at this, as we would say. Um, before we stepped in and developed a lot of the fixes that we've got uh, and, and come up with the tools and the procedures to do these things, we had to try to extend the life of those engines the best we could without a part or without a retrofit kit, if you will. So mm -hmm. uh, basically, the enemy to this IMS bearing is the engine oil. The engine oil is actually what starts the four stages of failure we're gonna go over a little bit later. And engine oil attacks the seal on the bearing. So the, one, the biggest thing you can do to help mitigate those chances of a loss by an IMS bearing failure is change the oil very frequently. And when I say frequently, I'm not talking about in miles because even my customers that purchase engines from me, I have to constantly keep them aware my service interval is every six months or 5,000 miles. Doesn't matter what the owner's manual says anymore. I've kind of reconstructed this thing into my own beast. And I know from my trend data and my used oil analysis and, and direct experience, when we start to see oil degrade. So the thing you have to understand about engine oil, a lot of people say, well, synthetic oil lasts a long time. Yes, it does. Compared to conventional oil, it lasts a, a really long time. But the problem we see is contaminants that intrude into this oil. You have water contamination. Moisture. You have, exactly. You have fuel contamination. Um, and any modern car has a high percentage of fuel contamination because as soon as it starts up, the injectors are dumping a lot of fuel in. The secondary air is trying to give some extra air into the exhaust system to help light off those catalytic converters. So when you crank up your 996 or your Boxster, you see smoke sometimes. That's not oil smoke a lot of times. It's fuel. And it's excess fuel being burned away. That fuel can get in the oil. By the piston rings, however, however it can get there, it'll end up in the oil. It contaminates the oil. So that helps to basically decrease the life of the oil. And that's important because a lot of Porsche owners, they may necess not necessarily see a lot of mileage annually. Absolutely. So they think, oh, well, I haven't driven my car much, so therefore my engine oil is probably good. But a lot of things can happen over six months to a year that ages, so to speak, the oil that requires you to change In it. In my first-hand direct experience, we see the worst oil samples from cars that set static versus cars that are driven in the same amount of mileage. Some of the worst oil samples I've seen from a corrosive wear perspective and from you know, contaminants comes from cars that have seen maybe 500 miles in a six month period versus cars that have saw that three or 4,000 miles in a six month period. Also cars that are driven short distance or they're allowed to set and start up cold and run before somebody gets in the car and drives it away, which is a huge thing. If you crank your car up in a morning where you are in Maryland and it's 20 degrees outside and you let it sit there and warm up, it's dumping a lot of excess fuel in the cylinders. It mm -hmm. takes too long for the engine to warm up. So that too long of a period is dumping fuel in the cylinders in excess amount, and that's getting by the rings. That contaminates the oil. oil. So short distance driving where you're not building a lot of oil temperature or coolant temperature or both, that is another huge contributing factor to what happens to the life of the oil. So oil is a lifeblood of the engine, but in a situation like this, that oil can have contaminants that will then attack the seal on the bearing, and it starts that first stage of failure. So 
we need to make sure we change our oil regularly, not based on miles. Make sure that we use good oil as well to keep, I guess, the lubrication properties and such uh, up high. What else can we look for? What else can we do? The other thing is situational awareness. So a lot of people these days are do-it-yourselfers with these cars. The cars have gotten to the price point where a lot of guys are buying a pair of ramps and they're buying oil and they're changing their own oil. It's a very simple thing to do. I actually promote my customers of engines to, to do their own oil changes because we both had something vested in the car. Mm -hmm. You take it to a local shop or something, they may even have the, the kid working there that's just started working on just something. Dumping and, and he's just away. dumping oil and he's not paying attention to anything. That's the worst possible thing. Never go to a quick lube place. This is a Porsche, it's not a Honda or a Toyota, sorry. You need to pay attention to things. Uh, we see a lot of quick lube places stripping drain plugs and causing well, all kinds of problems. Just so, growing up, you know, doing the oil changes at home, you know, just turning the plug out and inspecting the plug. Immediately. More than likely a tech's not, you know. And see, that really, brings up a, a good point. So the factory did not give us, with these engines, anything 993 and newer doesn't have a magnetic drain plug. Okay. But you can get one. But we, yeah, that, that's something that, that we developed in the aftermarket world, and, and it's a very strong 24 pound rare earth magnet, and it picks up everything in the sump. So that magnet is the key, it's like a window of the soul of this mm -hmm. engine, because you can pull it out, look at it, oh, I have contamination. Now that's only going to show you ferromagnetic debris, it's not going to show you the non ferromagnetic stuff, it's right. only going to show you you know, IMS bearing pieces, and, and, and it would show you that, but it wouldn't tell you if they had a cylinder failure or something like that mm -hmm. going on where you have no iron in the content. Um, but, you know, that magnetic drain plug is another thing you do to mitigate your losses. It helps you with your situational awareness. So when you drain the oil out of the car, look at that drain, mag, magnetic drain plug, and then remove the oil filter, and the first thing you want to do is don't dump the oil out of it. See what's in it. Stay, get dirty. This mm -hmm. is a dirty job, right? Mm -hmm. Get dirty, look at it. Don't dump it out, look at what's in there, pull the filter canister out, uh, fill the filter out of the canister, and then you want to cut the filter apart. And we can share some photos of some cut apart filters. Yeah. The audience look in like between the that. pleats. To exactly, see. unfold it like an accordion, mm -hmm. and, and then you can see what's in there. And you want to judge that on size, color, and quantity. Okay, um, you know, and how much of it is ferromagnetic, how much of it isn't, a refrigerator magnet. We'll right. tell you that. And that'll determine if you have steel or alloy type components in the oil or wear debris. Um, so those are really good things. Look at the bottom of that filter canister. That, uh, again, is another window to the sole of the engine because that collects a lot of debris. It falls from suspension, gravity puts it there, it doesn't really go anywhere a lot of times, and it stays there. You know, if you just take the filter and dump it out and you just throw the filter away, you've lost that ability to maybe catch a problem that may or may not be able to be addressed before you have a total failure. Now there are times where you find debris in the engine oil and it's already too late to do an IMS bearing retrofit even mm -hmm. because if you put a new bearing in, now you have debris laden oil and that's going to take out the new component. The debris so, from the earlier bearings is exactly. going to take out. And, and so that as a developer and, and coming up with this stuff, we want to protect what we've done. So the first thing I can tell you, if, if you've got debris in your oil, you must make those next steps very wise decisions. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to just throw another bearing in it, and, or you certainly don't want to keep driving the car because it's only going to get worse. Mechanical problems never get better unless you intervene. Yeah. They only get worse. Well, I, I, you touched on something that I think is also important and, and, and why I like to do my own oil changes is because I have, I have sort of a, a point of reference, right? I've always done my oil changes. So as I take things apart and I look down you know, there's always gonna be something in the oil. It's never perfectly clean. Like I can always see some kind of shiny bits or something like that. But if I do it regularly enough and I know how much to expect, if all of a sudden I see from a few particles, which is probably normal, to a good amount of particles that isn't normally there, like that's a telltale sign. Now that's because I have a reference point, but for someone that's buying a car used, um, I, I like what we did in, er, in an earlier video, I think it was in the 986 or 996 uh, pre-purchase inspection videos, we actually took down the sump. Because let's say this is a new car to me and you know I do the oil change to fill, but I don't have a point of reference and maybe the person that sold the car recently did an oil change. Mm -hmm. So whatever's in it is new and you take everything looks good, but there's still a chance that 
there is an issue with this if you didn't drop the sump. Yeah, and if you did a PPI and the shop was extensive with it, they should have already done that if you just bought the car. But that right. doesn't always happen exactly. that way. So yes, it, it, being consistent, looking for trend data, you know, remembering what the last oil service was like, taking a picture of it with your phone, whatever the case may be for size, color, and quantity. That's what you're always looking at, those three things. Uh, if you see more in the same interval period, well, you have to start thinking you got more of a problem. If you see less, well, maybe you changed oils or something, or maybe you're driving the car differently, whatever, and you, you saw less. But that brings up another point with used oil analysis. Okay, so used oil analysis is something we use as developers to help us develop oils. They help us develop components, uh, our coatings for certain components. Um, and a lot of times those used oil analysis can be used as trend data mm -hmm for us to notice a problem. The one thing I want to get across is if a viewer just does one single used oil analysis, it's, not. It, it, it's one small snapshot of the life of that engine. So um, it's not going to give you any real beneficial data. Now, like with me, where my customers buy an engine from me, by the time they take delivery of that car, we already have three used oil analysis from it. We're setting a trend from that point forward, if they want to keep on sending the oil to us and pay to have that done. So they, they, they have the data set to start Absolutely, with. and we can overlay that with part per million, graphs, whatever the case may be, for you know the viscosity, the anti-wear package, the detergent package, all these different things, and see if the oil is degrading. Because sometimes we find mechanical problems just because the anti-wear package in an oil has been depleted. We might not see the wear metals go up, but now we see the oil isn't as good as it used to be. So something hurt that oil. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're going to do oil analysis, you've got to routinely do it, and you have to do it religiously. And you have to use the same lab over and over again. You have to give the lab very good information, and you have to be very consistent with all the things you're going to do because it's one factor at a time testing. OFAD, as we say mm -hmm. in the development world. So you know, I use it a lot. We do 300 oil samples a year or more sometimes. I got folders, you know, thick of them. But I will also say that used oil analysis alone is not going to help you avoid an IMS buried failure. It is another trend data. It's another mm -hmm. point. It's going to help you. But that one thing alone, or really any one particular thing, is not going to help you mitigate those losses of this bearing failing by itself. So having good oil, trying to identify maybe some telltale signs either through the oil analysis or through your filter or through the sump, that's one thing. Can your driving style contribute? Or? Absolutely. So okay. the general consensus would be that cars that are raced or driven hard are cars that are going to blow up more. Any, any kind of blow up, no matter what it is. Mechanical failure is typically related to hard driving. In my first-hand direct experience, most phone calls I get are, I was driving 50 miles an hour when? That's not hard. Okay. <laughs> And that has been the idea behind what we see with the factory making the bearings different diameters because it changes the, the, the operating, speed. operating speed of that bearing at a given vehicle speed. So over time, we learned that the smaller diameter bearings like to spin higher speeds. Hmm. They, don't, they don't fail on the track. You hardly ever see that, but they fail at low speeds. The newer bearings, the larger bearings, they spin at a higher speed at a lower vehicle speed, and that helps remove load from them. And load is what we're facing. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have lubrication problems here. We have load capacity problems with these particular bearings and the, and the way they're fitted. So, you know, if you drive a car the way a Porsche should be driven, I'm not talking about driving like a Corvette where you're banging gears and just driving the snot out of the thing. You know, you drive it in a, a very reasonable, reasonable fashion. fashion. Yeah. But you, you don't want to drive around and shift into sixth gear in your 996 at 50 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be in fifth gear in your, in your base Boxster at 50 miles an hour. You know, I, I tend to try to keep my tachometer around 3,000 RPM. And that's where most and, of the fun is anyway in a and, Porsche. And, and you know why? Because I cut my teeth on air-cooled Porsches. Right. And you melt the engine if you don't do that because right. you have no fan speed. Right. So with an air-cooled car, you have no fan speed at low RPM. The engine gets hot. With this, you have no bearing speed at low RPM, and that leads to a problem. There's only two guarantees of anything mechanical, though. One, if it runs long enough, it's going to wear out, and it's going to break. Mm -hmm. That's the only guarantees. And when you work around mechanical things all your life like I have, you learn those are the only two guarantees. And there are things you can do to mitigate those chances. But yes, if it runs long enough, it's going to break. Eventually.